Welcome, welcome to everyone online and to the distinguished panelists that are here with me today. My name is Silvia Fernandez. I am the, the new chair of the GAMAC. Uh, GAMAC, as you well know, is, the, is, a, is a global action, it's a global alliance against mass atrocity crimes, uh, which is a, an inclusive network of states, civil society, and academic institutions that aim to galvanize understanding of and support for appropriate national policies and mechanisms to prevent massive atrocities on a permanent basis. And GAMAC also seeks to address drivers of violence, drivers of violence to address them very early before they escalate into violence and eventually into mass atrocities. So hate speech, hate speech, as we all know, is on rise, on the rise in the world. This is a global phenomenon. Uh, and this, is, uh, this hate speech is amplified by social media and the COVID-19 pandemic. So we all know now that hate speech is a precursor, is a driver of mass atrocities. So it is important to understand the root causes and address this phenomenon early enough to prevent atrocities. Now, to this effect, to this effect, the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies, MIX, with the support of GAMAC, started, uh, launched a series of, of sessions on decoding hate speech in September this year. The aim of this series was to increase the understanding of and raise awareness about online hate speech within the atrocity prevention community and beyond in the lead up to our global conference of GAMAC, which we call GAMAC 4, that will take place next year on hate speech, incitement, and discrimination precisely. So we've had uh, four sessions of this series of decoding hate speech. The first one was is particularly a focused on the concept of hate speech. What is hate speech? And the main takeaways of the first sessions were indeed the need to understand what is prohibited and clearly defined by international law, such as incitement to violence and also need the need to defend freedom of speech. There's always this tension that we need to understand and that we need to understand what are the limits, what is prohibited and what is absolutely legitimate. And another main takeaway of this first session was the importance of promoting early education in order to confront hate speech, build resilience and civic responsibility. Then there was a second session on the links between technology and hate speech. And here the main takeaways were the need for more regulation or of self-regulation by social media companies. Also the use, the need of using technology for monitoring hate speech as an early warning indicator and to promote counter narratives. Then there was a third session on the case study of Myanmar. And here the main takeaways were about the real world consequences of online hate, such as incitement to violence and in particular sexual and gender-based violence against the Rohingya on Facebook. And the other takeaway was the online, that online hate not only is a problem in fragile countries, but also in long standing democracies. No society is immune in this regard. So the uh, overall recommendation was to, of, uh, of all this series was to address this issue and that the joint efforts are required by multiple stakeholders, states, regional and international organizations and civil society, including academia as well and technology and social media companies. So today is the last one of this series of, uh, of sessions on decoding hate speech. And in today's session, we will look at the concrete steps that can be taken by the atrocity prevention community at national, regional, and international levels. So we are very grateful to our panelists for sharing their expertise and recommendations 
as we explore together with our online participants how we can contribute to countering hate speech at home and in our communities. So we will have first a conversation with our distinguished panelists, and you will then have the time to ask questions and share your thoughts. So we encourage you to use the chat to share any links to your work or insights you may have. And before I give the floor to them, and I will ask them some questions, um, I will say now something that I would have, should have said at the very beginning, which is that uh, please know that we have interpretation available in French and Spanish. So please, uh, if you want to select your preferred language, please click on the world icon for interpretation that you have in the bottom part of your screen. And there you can select the language of your choice. I am sorry, I didn't say this before. So now a quick uh, round of introductions to, to our, of our distinguished panelists. We, uh, our panelists are Noel Morada, who is a senior research fellow and director for regional diplomacy at the Asia Pacific Center for the Responsibility to Protect at the University of Queensland. He's a member of the GAMAC Asia Study Group. Unfortunately, Dr. Morada cannot be with us personally, uh, but we will uh, hear his thoughts on a pre-recorded uh, statement. Uh, with us here today, it is in the, she is indeed here, Ambassador Shara Duncan Villalobos, uh, who is a, career, is a lawyer, a specialist in human rights and international law, and a career diplomat. She is currently serving as Deputy Permanent Representative of Costa Rica to the United Nations Office and other international organizations based in Geneva. Ambassador Duncan is a member of GAMAC's steering group. Then we have here Kyle, Kyle Matthews, who is the executive director of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies, MICS, at Concordia University. At Concordia, he founded the Digital Mass Atrocity Prevention Lab, which works to counter online hate and extremism. Mix is also a distinguished GAMAX partner. And then last but not least, Ambassador Liberata Mula Mula, a distinguished career diplomat. She has served as Tanzania ambassador to the United Nations among other postings. She has also served as the first executive secretary of the Regional Intergovernmental Organization for Peace, Stability and Development in the Great Lakes region. Ambassador Mula Mula is a member of GAMAC's steering group and the patron of the GAMAC Africa Working Group. And here I can stop speaking so much and I can now really open up for the panel with one question that I would like to address to all of them. The first one is this one and it's related to the UN strategy and plan of action on hate speech. This plan of action of the UN states that it seeks to, one, enhance UN efforts to address root causes and drivers of hate speech, and two, enable effective UN responses to the impact of hate speech on society. So now, in light of these goals of the UN strategy and plan of action, I would like to ask you, what can GAMAC do to help the UN in achieving these goals? And maybe you can share some examples from your context on good practices, lessons learned, and approaches that can be implemented at the national, regional, and international levels. So the floor is yours. And so we will start with a recorded statement by Dr. Noel Morada. Hello, everyone. This is Noel Morada from the Asia Pacific Center for R2P in the University of Queensland, St. Lucia. On behalf of the Asia Pacific uh, Study Group of GAMAC, I'm making my presentation on hate speech in this panel to give you some ideas on the initial findings of the study group and also some recommendations. So our group was formed in 2018 um, in Kampala, Uganda, 
when uh, we had the GAMAC 3. So part of our uh, goal is to do some research and focusing on case studies. So for phase one, we're focusing on Myanmar, Philippines, and India. And in the second phase, you have Indonesia, uh, India, Pakistan, and Southeast Asia uh, in the context of the pandemic uh, for the period 2020, 2021. So we hope to present our findings in the uh, GAMAC 4 meeting in 2021 in the Netherlands. So as far as the definition of hate speech is concerned, we're using the UN uh, framework's uh, definition on hate speech. And when we talk about strategies for combating hate speech, we are actually looking at the legal or constitutional protections that prohibit uh, hate speech and discrimination, institutional, civil society, and faith-based actors, as well as the transitional justice approach, and then the diplomatic and multilateral support for stakeholders. Now, case studies on the Philippines and Myanmar is what I'm going to focus on in my presentation. So in the Philippines, the Mindanao conflict is the you know, focus of the Philippines case study. And the case study uh, identified what were the national and regional responses. So essentially uh, the case study uh, highlighted the transitional justice and reconciliation uh, responses of both national and regional government, Bangsamoro peace process, and then national and local laws that support the transitional justice and reconciliation efforts. Civil society organizations in the Philippines were also involved in advocacy campaigns against hate speech. And they're also into interfaith and solidarity dialogue, as well as uh, transitional justice initiatives at various levels. Now, the context in Myanmar is quite different because uh, there are many different ethnic groups and communal violence has been going on, uh, not just in Rakhine, but in other parts of the country. The military remains above the law and the civilian control is not over the military is not really present. So here uh, we are identifying uh, what has been the response of the previous government, the USDP and the NLD. So both were ineffective in dealing with hate speech because of you know, existing uh, discriminatory laws that are still in place. And even the NLD has not done much uh, in regard to the prevention of hate speech and discrimination. Civil society groups in Myanmar are very active, uh, but at the same time, we need to point out also that advocacy campaigns and interfaith dialogue, the impact of this uh, needs to be uh, considered and remains to be seen. Now, it's important that I need to highlight also that Myanmar and the Philippines are both members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which uh, already had a declaration on culture of prevention. And part of this uh, culture of prevention idea is uh, combating hate speech, and hate crime and intolerance and misinterpretation of culture, okay? And uh, senior officials of ASEAN met in 2019 to give more substance into this declaration by coming up with uh, initial campaigns in 2019 and 2020. Now, some of the mechanisms, and this is where the recommendation would come in uh, in the context of ASEAN, Myanmar and the Philippines being part of ASEAN. So engaging uh, various stakeholders within the mechanisms of ASEAN, the Human Rights Commission, the Commission on Protection of Women and Children, and the Institute of Peace and Reconciliation. Training and capacity building are also very important, as well as developing domestic and regional networks that will promote the culture of prevention. Now, there are also mechanisms uh, within ASEAN that deal with dialogue partners like the UN and other countries. So I think uh, part of the action that can be done in the context of culture of prevention and in that regard also combating hate speech would be 
advocating for incorporating atrocities prevention in ASEAN's agenda, provide uh, support for research exchanges and training and capacity building, and then provide scholarships for young people, the youth, uh, in their postgraduate uh, studies, for example, in areas of peace and conflict prevention, and then also engage with various stakeholders, including non-state actors who are playing a critical role in atrocities prevention, conflict prevention, and peace building. Thank you very much for your time and thank you for listening. Thank you very much for this. I will now give the, uh, the floor to Ambassador Shara Duncan, on the same question, what can GAMAC do to help? And can you share some examples from your context on good practices? Thank you very much, Ambassador. You have the floor. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the floor and, and for inviting me today to this important conversation. Let me just bring up my notes so I don't lose track of what I want to say. Um, I believe um, that together with the spread of false information, this issue is one of the worst consequences of what some have called the post-truth or the post-truth era. And also one of the consequences of the backlash of the advancement of human rights. Uh, we have witnessed the rise in populism and the accession to power of some of its leaders around the world, equally in the Americas as in Asia, Africa, or Europe. So I don't think there is a continent that has not been a witness to this phenomenon. And people and social movements uh, that, that cite hatred have turned to social media, as you said before, to spread misinformation, fear, garner support and adapt and spread hate and lies. One of the most difficult issues around hate speech is that we do not have a legal definition of this under international law. Some states have very strict laws, laws that do not allow for the incitement of, of hate under any circumstances. Others, for example, in the case of the United States, um, it can only be criminalized when it directly incites imminent criminal activity or consists of specific threats of violence targeted against a person or a group. Otherwise, um, even if it's scandalous, um, it is protected by the constitution. Other countries uh, like my own, they don't have specific provisions relating to, to hate speech, but have more general provisions relating uh, to what we call crimes against the honor, like defamation or, or calumny. And in general, I think there is a feeling that the line that separates those legal provisions that provide protection to others and their dignity from hate and those that intend to limit free speech or freedom of expression is very, very thin and it needs to strike a very delicate balance. One of the, sorry, um, one of the most basic actions perpetrators of mass atrocities do is disenfranchisement and hate speech on social media have come to demonstrate, unfortunately, great means to achieve precisely that. We often think about perpetrators of mass atrocities as monsters or crazy, but the truth of the matter is that numerous studies made by, by behavioral uh, psychologists demonstrate that most of them were ordinary everyday people like you and me and, and people watching uh, us today that were capable of doing the most heinous acts to other human beings driven by hate, apathy or the notion that the other is not human like them or is trying to somehow destroy them. So to tackle hate speech and most importantly, its root causes um, is a matter of the utmost importance when it comes to prevention of mass atrocities, especially early prevention strategies. And that is why I find it so timely and important that the UN establish its strategy and plan of action on hate speech and that it can work uh, together with states and other stakeholders to provide them with guidelines and suggestions on how to deal with hate speech. And at the very core of the strategy, there is the notion that states cannot do it on their own. There is a need to work together with civil society, international organizations, individuals, the private sector, and other states to achieve a multi-actor holistic approach that allows society to act as a whole and to coordinate efforts. And it is in this logic that I believe initiatives like GAMA can be of great help. Um, achieving these goals. As a platform for information and experience sharing, we can help through the global meetings and through activity, activities such as, as today's to set up uh, the collaborative work that needs to be done and to match knowledge, experience, and success stories with others who may come from a country situation that may require access 
to all that information and ideas to try to replicate international context. I believe in the power of information sharing and discussions based on best practices, as well as learning from others. We must remember that tackling hate speech um, is a matter of basic dignity and human rights, and it actually helps with the construction of peaceful societies that respect the rights and human dignity of minorities, women, children, and, and it, it is even a tool uh, that helps us in countering terrorism, radicalization, and radical extremism when it is conducted through terrorism. So I would like to leave it at that for now. Um, and maybe I can, I can provide a, a few um, examples in, in the next round. I don't want to take too much of the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ambassador. And thank you as a lawyer for also recalling some of the uh, lacuna in the regulatory uh, framework of, of what we are addressing today, among other important reflections that we will come back to them uh, in, uh, in the course of this, uh, of this uh, panel. Now, I would like to hand over to um, Kyle Matthews to address the same question. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, congratulations on your post. We look forward to working with you. Um, and as a partner of this event, MIGS, I'd like to thank everyone. Um, I think this is, uh, these sessions are a way of building knowledge and operationalizing and having GAMAC play a role in helping the UN implement its framework on hate speech. Um, so let me first begin by basically saying that I think the hate speech, the incitement is the key to prevention of mass atrocities. Um, we, we saw from Rwanda, um, the genocide that took place in 94. Long before that, we saw incitement hate speech on radio uh, as a primary tool to, to demonize groups. And, and so that's a key lesson. But as we look back now in 2020, 26 years later, we now have this whole digital infrastructure um, that has uh, had done amazing things for humanity, but also has a dark side to it. Um, and, and we've seen that there is now growing amounts of governments, states that are trying to say, especially in COVID when we're all online, we realize that everything on the digital world can lead to offline behavior, that we're really kind of struggling to see how can we deal with this space and actually make a contribution to the atrocity prevention community. Um, my colleagues and I, we started looking at social media as incitement back in, in uh, 2011 on the 10th anniversary of the Responsibility Protect. We mentioned that we should have a, a social media campaign for trust prevention. People laughed at us. Uh, they kind of thought it was ridiculous. Um, and, and now, um, just four or five years after that, we saw a rise of ISIS, a non-state actor that used social media for a whole set of purposes uh, to incite violence, to brainwash people with ideology. And I think the whole world woke up and they said, hey, yes, these social media platforms, uh, they're great to share images of your cat or what you had for breakfast, but they can also be used and weaponized, result in a real uh, negative impact on human rights around the world. So, so that's key. And, and I, I think the UN framework for hate speech that was introduced by um, the former uh, special advisor, Adama Diang and Antonio Guterres is a key framework to get the multilateral system working on this issue. And I think the digital side is perhaps the most complicated one because we've been very reactive to it, not proactive. Um, we saw from the case of Myanmar, where as a closed society um, uh, opened up a little bit, social media came into the country, Facebook became the main communication uh, vehicle for people searching the internet, that it was weaponized. We had nationalist Buddhist monks use their profiles on Facebook to incite hate against Rohingya. We've actually had, after the fact, we realized that Facebook did not um, have enough moderators that understood the local language. And then that was abused by certain people to incite hate against Rohingya, including military officials and government officials. So we missed that boat. We have to, I think the entire atrocity prevention community, civil society, academia, um, international government organizations and national governments need to really start to operationalizing and, and start looking more forward looking, uh, not being reactive, but more pro proactive. So some of the cases that we've seen that, that perhaps we need to look at, I know after the electoral violence in Kenya, after the 2007 elections that was contested, uh, following that, the Kenyan government basically really took this seriously and actually set up uh, teams of people monitoring social media platforms to look for hate speech and incitement. And that helped reduce the violence for the next election. Um, we had a case in Sri Lanka where um, following an ISIS attack on a church during Easter, 
but also some other um, uh, violence between uh, erupted between um, uh, religious groups. We saw that to WhatsApp and closed messaging platforms were being used to incite violence. The state replied the only way they could was to shut off internet access. Uh, so that tempered the situation, but that poses other big major questions about freedom of expression and is the response of shutting down the internet really the way to go forward. So I think there's a lot of things that GAMAC can do. Um, GAMAC, the, the one thing I'd say for is that to deal with th this, this issue of hate speech, particularly the online space, which is now happens at the national level, at a regional level, but it's also transnational. Um, anybody can inflame passions in a society. We have uh, evidence as uh, Ambassador Shara Duncan mentioned that uh, there's an issue of misinformation. And very often we have sometimes nefarious actors or authoritarian states that are using social media to actually try to polarize other societies and try to play off um, um, any incidents between ethnic groups or religious groups. So we have to be careful of that. But um, what I would arg argue that what needs to be done is that um, we need to engage a tech sector. Um, the technology is moving so quickly that we really have to understand how to catch up. We need to have key people in all organizations that are starting to understand tech sector, um, you know, how social media platforms operate, what legislation is being imposed to regulate social media companies on hate speech. We had Germany passed a very interesting legislation. Uh, just this week, the European Union passed something. Governments are struggling to get the right legislation to balance, prevent hate, uh, and to respect human rights. So I think that's a key area that we need to look at this legislation and find the right balance. No one has the answers. Uh, we need to look at emerging technology. We have uh, stuff like uh, deep fake technology that are artificial intelligence altered uh, videos that can make any any state leader or religious leader look like they're saying something or inciting passions. This is something that that we don't know how to deal with. We have AI powered audio that can change people's voices. Uh, we don't we know that algorithms by Facebook cannot pick up memes and images on their platforms that might be inciting hate. So there's a lot of technical stuff we must understand. But I think there's a key here that we GAMAC, and maybe I'll leave this because I'm not tracking the time that I'm on and we can answer in questions, but I think GAMAC is ideally placed. We have um, one issue I think we need. We need to have cross-cultural teams. It's great to have a team in Canada that works with an AI company here that has the tools to monitor social media or certain platforms, but we don't have the cultural knowledge to understand what does an incitement mean? Uh, or what derogatory terms are used in a particular context, in a particular country, in a particular language? So I think GAMAC can play that role. Um, I, I'm a firm believer that by helping this discussion, we're going to bring more knowledge and expertise together to work collaboratively. And that will lead to a real kind of concrete plan of action at the GAMAC meeting in The Hague in, in um, the fall of 2021 which I hope we're all gonna be able to travel to, uh, but we'll bring in some outside actors from the tech sector, others doing really innovative work, perhaps from disinformation space that can build um, networks with GAMAC and its partners. Um, so those are my opening comments. Uh, I hope they, uh, they help shed some light on what's happening and I look forward to a wider discussion. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Indeed, it helps very much to have the uh, uh, the overall uh, vision of what is the problem and what we understand and what we do not understand. And thank you for all your very concrete uh, ideas for, for the future, uh, including for GAMAC 4. Now I will give uh, the floor to the uh, last speaker, uh, uh, Ambassador Liberata Mula Mula. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Justice Sylvia. I really want to thank uh, the GAMAC Support Office for organizing uh, this important uh, uh, platform of debate, the continued uh, series on hate speeches. Uh, first of all, I want also to appreciate the fact that uh, the United Nations finally recognized the need of coming up with a comprehensive uh, understanding and strategy for dealing or countering the hate speeches. Uh, Kyle, in fact, was like he was reading my notes because I was saying for, for us in, in Africa, because when you mentioned the hate speech, what comes to our mind is going back to the legacy of the Rwanda genocide, how incitement by then, of course, they didn't have a name as hate speech, but then by using radio uh, and the infamous uh, Radio Miracolin, 
uh, how it led to the massacre of uh, more than almost a million people. Just through incitement of the general populations. Uh, of course, um, as uh, Shara said, eight speech is about targeting one group of, of people against the other. So this is what happened. But then it is almost I mean, 26 years. No, but of course, people talk about it, but nothing concrete, at least at the community level, was done. And uh, that's why I'm saying it is uh, I appreciate that the UN, it is especially through the uh, initiative of our dear brother, Adam Gang, that they came up with this strategy. And I hope it will go beyond the strategy. You know, um, of course, part of the advisory group of the Secretary General, we always say your strategy can only be tested at the national front and in the field. So we hope this will go beyond having either a strategy or resolution and test it, especially now. We are in a very difficult uh, situation, of course, with the COVID-19 pandemic that has brought also a new dimension of uh, misinformation, fake news, but also causing panic through the, of course, the social media, but for us, especially in our African countries, very few people, of course, have access to the social media, but they still believe what they hear through the radio, through the TVs. And um, people, unfortunately, and they also shall, I think, spoke about this uh, populism, using the poor people, the population, manipulating them to accept what is not true. <laughs> and uh, this is, um, this is what has led some of the governments, of course, to come out and be heavy handed, to have hand heavy handed measures, as also was mentioned by Carl, Kyle. Because during, especially for African countries, you see this in manifestation during the election period. <laughs> and this is why some of the governments of the countries have taken the extreme way of shutting down the social media during the election period because this is where the hate speech really come into play, where you have, uh, of course, the, the political parties, the opposition using this uh, social media, using, of course, any platform, trying to get uh, their voters, but uh, inciting them against, against each other. So this is the time, and for the first time, I am in, I'm speaking from Tanzania, I've been here for a while, following the outbreak of COVID, we had an uh, election in October, last October, for the first time in the history of Tanzania, that you had a total shutdown, <laughs> a total shutdown of the social media, of the media, <laughs> the control. They passed even legislation to be able to, to regulate the information, to regulate the media, to regulate the freedom of information. And of course, we had, uh, Tanzania had uh, a lot of condemnation for doing this. But, uh, in a way, of course, this is the way of uh, trying to deal, deal with this, uh, the, uh, the hate speeches, especially during the election. And that's what has led to what Kyle said, the experience we had of, um, of Kenya. People tend to forget, but Kenya in 2007, 2008, it was through these hate speeches, through, of course, the, we have the problem of the ethnics of the tribal, but then how they used it we are almost going to experience another genocide in Kenya. In fact, there was not a quick intervention from the various um, actors. So I'm saying for, for, for Africa, there are a number of issues which come to mind when we speak of this, but we have always in mind that the experience of Rwanda shapes whatever uh, interventions, whatever decisions, whatever frameworks have been established that never, never, never again will ever see uh, genocide that is in, the, in our continent. But two, and this is also what we have seen during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, that there is always a mistrust. There's no trust of government. And this of course also causes a lot of tension <laughs> among uh, the communities, among uh, the societies that there's no trust. And with heightened tension, then this is also becomes a breeding ground for the hate speeches either of course vis-a-vis -vis the government or vis-a-vis -vis whatever uh, sectors of the, of the communities. So this is, I said, we are in a very unprecedented times. 
And when we talk of the hate speeches, I must want to underline the fact that uh, it involves both the misinformation, the, I mean, exaggerations <laughs> of what is put out there, which of course, as I said, causes panic, causes tension, causes insecurity. So it is something we take very seriously. I know, of course, when you are talking to the Western world, there's this, um, the individual freedoms. But then we have seen also what has caused these state speeches is the what we call individual freedom, but the individual behavior. Because with the online, online uh, access or whatever posts, whatever they post on online, it's at the individual level, it's not even an institution. Somebody will say, okay, somebody from, from Tanzania put it there, they say, no, this is not even somebody, we don't know even who. Those developed countries, they can be able to trace. I've seen it on Washington, Facebook being called to the Congress for hearing to explain. But then we don't, some of our countries, we don't have that even the means, the capacity to be able to trace these individuals who cause this uh, online. So it is quite a, a challenge to deal with it. But then, as I said, um, there are some good practices at the level of the Gamma. Gamma is the platform, of, it's very unique because. This is what maybe whenever I want to underline or be able to brag about it. It bring, brings everyone <laughs> from the states. If they if at all there are issues for the state to take care in terms of uh, controlling these state stages, we have the states represented. We have the, the, I mean, the civil society represented. We have most important, we have the academia represented who can be able to do research and establish the consequences of these hate speeches. So on that regard, that's what I'm saying within GAMAC in our African working group, when we are deciding on what initiative to take, uh, of course, uh, in the context of the GAMAC 4 that is coming, we decided that we should have conducted research on hate speech to see, to show, to be able to show evidence that it is a trigger of atrocity crimes. We all speak about it, but we want to have evidence-based and this is what we have taken as our project. And uh, we hope that uh, we'll be able to come up with something that will serve as lessons and good practices to be able to avoid uh, these hate speeches. Finally, I also wanted to, to share with you, I shared these links with, um, with uh, Sabrina. I'll be able, I hope she'll be able to put them up. In, in Nigeria, I think you have been hearing what has been happening in Nigeria. But then something that came up, which I wanted to share with you, that um, they have decided to institutionalize the fact checking, checking entities for fake news and hate related speeches. So they have it online. Whatever is put up, then they have counter, counter information to counter those hate speeches and fake news. So there is a link that um, Sabrina will show with you. It is a non-partisan advocate of civic awareness and participation. So it contributes to the political process in Nigeria by providing the facts to counter politically motivated deception and falsehood. Then also in our region, in East Africa, you have what they call unakika. Unakika is a Swahili word which says, are you sure of what you are saying? So they have established also another check fact link, which if you go through it, you will see by use of the technology that you can be able to counter those hate speeches and the harmful effects of misinformation. So I thought I should share with you and I'll come in again when there are specific questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's very comprehensive. Uh, a first uh, approach to the problem and extremely specific and concrete on also thank you for sharing with us your experience within the Africa uh, GAMAC Africa working group and the useful extremely useful work you are doing there maybe I would like to add you ask you one for uh, one question rela related to your specific experience with the within the international conference on the Great Lakes region <laughs> Uh, because you, uh, as, 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 as you all may know, this uh, conference adopted, uh, drafted and adopted in 2006, a protocol for prevention 
and the punishment of the crime of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity and all forms of discrimination. And this aims uh, or has one of its goals is combating all forms of discrimination and has declared that any incitement, that this is very important, that any incitement to hatred or discrimination is an offense punishable, punishable by law. But this is extremely yes. important when we are having this, this discussing here about the, the lacuna in the uh, mm -hmm. in framework. So maybe uh, Liberata, could you elaborate on the implementation progress of this article? Yes, I, <clears throat> thank you, sir. You have been noting the in the legal fraternity because uh, given again going back to Rwanda, this was out of the experience, the, the side experience of Rwanda, that the the heads of state of the Great Lakes region from eleven countries, they decided that uh, they should come up with the illegally binding, illegally binding pact, which would be like a UN charter, but for the region that would put an end to all factors that led to the, of course, genocide, but also to the cyclic violence in the region. So one of the legal instrument that was adopted within this pact on peace and stability was this uh, uh, protocol on prevention and uh, punishment. Here I underline punishment of all the crimes of uh, genocide and all other crimes. So the most important element in the protocol is that they provided for structures institutionalizing because you have the legal framework, but then they said we have to take it from the framework and have it operationalized at the national and regional level. So they provided the structures that were to be implemented or established at, by all member states at the national level and regional level to be able to prevent and fight impunity. I'm happy to say, since I was a cause, you mentioned when you are reading out my, my bio, I was uh, the first executive secretary of the International Conference on the Great Lakes region, where I was given the mandate and my term of references was to ensure that uh, these protocols are fully implemented. So what we did, first and foremost, was uh, to establish the national committees, which of course never existed, the national committees on the prevention of genocide. But two was to bring all actors, and this is again, of course, it nowadays called leaving no one behind, that every part or segment of the society actor should be part of this process. So we had the women, we had the youth, we had uh, the civil society, of course, the private sector to be part, not only the government, because when we established these national committees, of course, they are government led, but we said, you cannot leave it to the government, that all these people should be involved. So we had all these committees established, which are multidimensional, but might uh, stakeholders to have to follow. The most important <clears throat> aspect of this was to monitor, to follow, but also act as early warning. And as I'm speaking, almost all these countries have these national committees. Some, of course, are more <clears throat> proactive. Some, of course, where they find, like, a, a, like in Zambia, they're saying, we don't have any problems. Why do we have this committee on Virginia? The two the initiative was says that decisions are made at the regional level, but implementation and the impact is done at the at the national level. So this is what has helped to be the ears and eyes of uh, of the governments of the communities, early warning sort of. So I must say, of course, it's not that all is rosy and nice, but at least. This one, these structures have helped that if there is anything, it is reported. And at the regional level, the summits, heads of state, they meet at extraordinary summit if there is some indication that uh, the situation has gone out of hand and we might have another Rwanda. 
So that I um, just want to share with you that, uh, and this is through GAMAC. That's why we are also through the working group to establish regional mechanisms and the national mechanism for the prevention, for the prevention. Because we still have problems with fighting impunity because the perpetrators, some are all over the world. And of course, we, 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 we think that some of the governments like France have been collaborating to bring back these perpetrators of genocide. So let me end here. This is my, I, I can take the whole session to talk about this. So I don't want to go beyond, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for, for this answer and for your enthusiasm as, as usual. And thank you for bringing to the discussion uh, the one element that had not yet been mentioned, but it is there also the importance of accountability uh, in order to fight impunity. This is great that you brought this to, to, to the discussion. And of course, the need uh, of, uh, of the, uh, the proper architecture national and regional mechanisms. This is also a great importance and, and I'm glad that you emphasize this and, and share with, with us your, uh, your experience in this regard in, in Africa and, in, and, and the efforts in this regard by the working group. And third, again, again, confirming the importance of an inclusive approach in order to have a holistic approach as Shara uh, has uh, has mentioned in her own intervention, and maybe I will have a question to to Shara, maybe a follow up question on this because this is hugely important. So, since since common efforts and engagement are needed, how can you can could you elaborate further on how we can build fruitful relationships under a whole inclusive society approach? difficult question, but I'm sure you can also share with us, maybe also specifically, some maybe elaborate a bit on, on good practices from Costa Rica in particular, encountering hate and incitement to, to violence for to minority groups, such as uh, minorities of African descent and LGBT community. So Shara, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yes, um, it's it's not um, an easy question. It's, it's not an easy answer to give. Um, but I, I think that, first of all, I would like to say that even if the main responsible for tackling hate speech is the state, it's not the sole responsible for this. We, we all can play and we all should play a part. And, and by we, I mean society as a whole. I am talking here about the private sector in general, the media, sports associations and teams um, in places, for example, where football is a very big uh, thing. Um, they're more efficient than any government in carrying the message. Also civil society organizations and of course partnering up with international organizations that are present in your country on the ground. And of course, individuals, we all have a part to play. Number two, building peaceful societies requires inclusion. So we cannot tackle hate speech and its root causes in a sustainable manner if we continue having societies where some or most feel excluded and frustrated. That is why the SDGs, for example, um, are an important tool when it comes to resolving many of the underlying issues. We need to think about hate speech as a symptom of a bigger disease. Of course, implementing the SDGs requires time and resources, but countries have made a commitment to achieve by 2030 the objectives of the agenda, and that will help in countering inequalities. So there should be an effort to somehow have the agenda implemented across the board um, through all sectors of your society and bringing together all actors of, of society. My third point has to do with education. Um, states should have a human rights-based education system incorporate the human rights perspective in their education systems will in the long run be more effective and cheaper than any other tool in achieving peace, peaceful societies. But education is not only given through the formal school system. You can actually develop workshops, go to the community, communities, keep them engaged, promote peaceful relations. And here I would like to offer an example of a good practice we have in my country. Um, we have um, the ministry, the vice minister, vice ministry of peace 
under the umbrella of the Ministry of Justice and Peace. Um, and that has a standing system of continued education based on non-discrimination and human rights and inclusion. And they're in charge of the strategic strengthening of the prevention of violence and the creation of a culture of peace. They have created a network of civic centers for peace. This is, this is the name um, that basically through activities and community engagement work with, with the objective um, to consolidate peace and, and to develop peaceful communities. So they have discovered that getting people engaged and building life together is actually one of the best remedies against exclusion and hate. And recently, and, and this comes back to the COVID-19 pandemic and, and all the, the inequalities and, and suffering that it has actually shown us, um, there, when the second wave of the pandemic hit my country, it coincided with the harvest of the melons and the pineapples in the north part of my country. We had our, our borders closed. So um, the, the, the seasonal workers that usually come um, to, to work harvesting the melons and the pineapples were not supposed to come to Costa Rica because the borders were closed. Nevertheless, the owners of the farms decided to, to go um, and, and bring some of these uh, migrant workers um, to, to, to recollect the, the melons and the pineapples. And it was, of course, in the worst conditions, they were all cramped in, in jeeps and buses and the lodging was not the adequate lodging and, and it was actually very bad managed and they did not keep any measures, any social distancing, nothing. So the, the xenophobia uh, augmented a lot and people were actually connecting the presence of the migrant workers um, with the second wave of, of the COVID-19. So the, the Ministry of, uh, the Vice Ministry of, of Peace decided to engage in, in, um, in a strategy to reduce hate speech, to tackle hate speech when it came to, to, this, to this specific issue. Um, they were very successful. Uh, we, still, we still haven't finished measuring the effects of the, of the campaign, but we were using hashtags as xenophobia is a virus and you can stop, you have to stop this virus, which is hate. Um, and, and they had presence in social media, traditional media and banners and movies around town, et cetera. And lastly, I think states should at all times respect and uphold human rights and democratic values. Uh, meaning you cannot combat hate speech by restricting human rights, freedom of speech and freedom of, of expression. Um, they should always be upheld, defended and promoted. And I think you can be more effective as a state letting other voices be heard than restricting the ones that you consider dangerous. So uh, states should be partnering up with uh, stakeholders such as influencers or reach out to independent and traditional media and others and have all tools in place so people can organize and work together and have a vibrant and engaged civil society. And lastly, um, because Liberata mentioned the, the fact-checking initiative that you have, in Costa Rica, we have uh, something similar. Um, it's very tricky though, um, because the, the, the presidency of the Republic decided to put up this, this tool, and then you had people saying, no, but this is part of the conspiracy to, to manipulate us, and this is not true. And then when, when traditional media actually comes forward and says, no, this is what you're saying, it's not true, then say, well, the traditional media is, is, is a sold out to, to the power. And you know, there's always someone who can say no to the traditional or to the, um, you know, the, the, the state, uh, the official fact-checking. Um, so that's why I think it's very important to give the space to civil society and to individuals to actually do this job. Um, so you can also have, and you should have the fact checking uh, systems and the, the, the traditional media should also have it, but also allow for other actors to, to come and, and to give um, 
to provide these these services and 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 try to counter um, the 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 false information that is prevailing uh, in social media these days. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Shara, for this very, very concrete uh, 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 description of how initiatives to counter uh, 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 hate speech and fake news and check facts uh, through uh, an inclusive approach. Thank you very much for this. And this brings us back to, to Kyle, uh, who, uh, who already um, talked uh, quite a bit on, on, on the use of technology and, 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 and digital means to, to spread hate speech. So, uh, and you already uh, mentioned this and, and, and maybe we can come back to this issue that technology is obviously a, a double-edged sword because it can be used for, for bad and also for, for good. So maybe I'm going back to what can GAMAC do? I would like to ask you, how can GAMAC deal uh, or contribute to deal with this misuse of the internet and social media for spreading hate speech and engage private sector actors, including social media companies in a fruitful, constructive dialogue? And, and maybe in addition to this, what kind of efforts do we have to make to confront online hate? You already addressed this, but maybe it would could be good if you could elaborate. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, I, I would first say that the um, that tech companies are under increasing pressure um, by all many many states um, that they realize their platforms are being abused. Um, there was talk earlier that in, uh, I think Ambassador uh, uh, Mula Mula mentioned that individuals, not just states now, but individuals are, are empowered by social media platforms. They hide behind anonymous accounts and they feel they can, they can do certain things anonymously that they wouldn't do as individuals. So, so we've, we've seen um, there's a recognition of, of, of all these tech platforms that there's a problem. They're under increasing pressure. The EU passed legislation earlier this week. Canada's looking to apply regulation. So, so there's a willingness, I would, I would argue, um, among many of these um, platforms, tech companies, to start taking this more seriously. Particularly Facebook, uh, uh, looking at what happened in um, in Myanmar. So, I, I think there's two things that can be done. First, go back as a platform. I think the the conference coming up in 2021, it would be very important for. Gamac and his partners to reach out to some of these tech companies and, and invite them there. Uh, you know, Microsoft, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, they all have uh, public policy officers in Europe. It, it wouldn't be that too much trouble to invite them to come to that. Um, then also, there's also the, 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 the misinformation element. Uh, at, a re at the previous event, we had uh, Chris Tuckwood uh, of the Sentinel Project, that's a partner of Gamac, said, um, hate speech loads the gun, but uh, misinformation pulls the trigger. Um, so there's also a wider network of people that, that could be brought into the discussion. I, I think one thing to keep in mind is that um, individual organizations like MIGs or civil society organizations in key countries do engage with elected officials, members of parliament, senators, to push these issues up the agenda. We have discussions with our foreign ministries, but we also have discussions with uh, other government agencies that are dealing with hate speech at the domestic level. So we can actually connect some of those people and, and try to get some support for our governments to actually A, support the UN framework on hate speech, try to get some support funding to actually uh, have more initiatives on this and also push that to kind of coalesce at the GAMAC meeting. But, but I think there has to be a lot more strategic outreach, a lot more dialogue with multiple actors because on the digital space um you know these platforms are in the u.s they're protected by the u.s constitution and free speech laws and so we really need to collaborate with them and and, and understand what their concerns are and but build up some some more collaborative network so I, I would say if we aim to do something with gamac a year from now uh, it could it could lead to some really interesting issues like a coalition of partners on online hate speech, hate speech, and the atrocity prevention field. Thank you, thank you very much for for this uh, for this answer. And uh, now I would like to open the space uh, for for our audience to to have a chance of asking you some questions. There is already one coming from the floor. Um, 
which uh, uh, is based on, on our different uh, panel discussions, it says the question, based on our different panel discussions, to confront hate speech, there is a clear need for both civic engagement and education against hate speech online. So the question is, what role should GAMA play in using education as a tool for addressing and countering hate speech at the national level? I don't know who wishes to, to answer this question, Kai. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I don't mind um, 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 making a few opening comments. Um, there is increasing um, understanding that um, that we live in this kind of infodemic, that there's so much information online. Um, lots of it is not, is not always correct. Sometimes it's misleading um, and particularly related to hate speech and tied to this misinformation um, that digital literacy is a key component. There, there's recognition, for example, in Canada, um, the Canadian Department of Heritage that deals with anti-racism as well as building um, a citizen resilience to misinformation and hate speech. They're now giving out a lot of funding to get Canadian organizations to um, try to create more digital literacy programs targeting in the formal education sector, but also working um, with a vast array of partners to also um, try to build the critical thinking skills, digital literacy skills of citizens. And so, so I, I think that's true. We see UNESCO, particularly on hate speech and extremism, they recently held in Canada a major conference on internet youth and extremism. They're now building, uh, they have all sorts of educational tools from about the Holocaust, about uh, Holocaust denial, um, doing interesting work and tons of uh, educational material. So that could be used to, by GAMAC to invite UNESCO and other national governments to present some of the, the best, um, you know, the best practices that they're doing and see what key countries really need some support in dealing with this. Not every country is the same. Some are much more fragile. Some have a harder time managing diversity. So, so that could be, um, I think, one way um, to build the, the digital literacy is, is a key component for this. Thank you very much, Kyle, for, for this uh, answer. Charlotte, would you like to answer something at this point? Uh, yes, I, I, I totally agree with what Kyle has actually said. Um, but also I think that we need to, and I think that is important that we engage the, the formal uh, sector and the formal tools that we have for education because of, of the same thing I said before. Um, but, but I think it's also important to acknowledge that there is some education that doesn't happen in the school and in the formal system. Um, and, and, and I don't know, I, I would like to, to, to tell you and give you an example, an example of the kind of work and the kind of um, education that private sector and civil society and governments can actually do uh, to tackle these issues. And for this, I would like to use the example of my country. In 2018, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights uh, rendered an advisory opinion that it was actually sought by Costa Rica, establishing our obligation under the Inter-American Convention to recognize same-sex same unions. We were towards the end of the political campaign when this subject came up and, and it proved to be extremely divisive and we ended up with a painfully, painfully polarized uh, presidential election. For the first time in more than 100 years, a religious party actually came into the political arena in my country and its leader went from having 3% of the intention of vote to going as the first runner up on the second round of the presidential elections with 26% of the national votes based solely in an anti-gay campaign. So their message was openly against human rights and international human rights law. Um, he actually promised to take Costa Rica out of the inter-American system of human rights and, and to denounce all the conventions and human rights treaties. So this, this party did not win the election, but they left us with with an extremely polarized, um, an extremely polarized society. Somehow people felt empowered to discriminate, discriminate against others. And there were several reports of LGBTI people being insulted and attacked in public uh, spaces. So in this context, and with, with same, same sex marriage bound to be a reality on 26 May 2020 this year, one person had, had an idea and um, 
She is the president of the Homo Parental Families Association in Costa Rica, and she decided to convince others and, and, and other CSOs to join her efforts and together start a movement that is, it was called Movement for the Same-Sex Civil Marriage. And, and they started a campaign to counter the hate that was being still spread in social media by the same party and others and unite Cos the Costa Rican society after what was um, the, the, the painful experience that we had in the elections. Um, the objective that set out to, they set out to achieve was actually to convey a message that could unify Costa Rica build on the values that we have in common, the love that we feel for our own, and not the opinions that divide us. So that, that was basically the, the idea they had. And so they did. They decided not to focus, uh, focus on traditional activism. Uh, for example, they, they decided not to use the diversity flag at all. And they came up with the name of the campaign, which was Si Acepto, which is the Spanish version of Yes, I Do. And so they, they showed real families, real people, real friends, um, focusing on the experience they had when they found out that their loved one was an LGBTI person and how important it was for them to see loved ones happy and fulfilled. It was very, very powerful to see Costa Ricans from all economic and geographical contexts uh, sharing their love for others on, on national television. Even, um, in halftime, in the halftime of the games of our national football team, um, that basically means everyone saw the com the campaign, and and they had they used social media banners all over the country, bus stops, etc. The campaign, which was very costly, was actually a, a success due to the the what they did with private sector advertising agencies, TV, newspapers, food, drink, and event companies who actually became co-sponsors and gave money, time, space, uh, and everything to, to the initiative. And it has been so successful that they were actually able to measure the acceptance and um, the, the perception of Costa Ricans before the campaign and after. And they did this survey one year, exactly one year, one after the other. And, and, I, and I will close by saying this, um, the percentage of people who were totally in disagreement um, in 2019 uh, was of 38.7% of people who were surveyed. And it went from 38.7 to 25.10 in one year, in 2020. And people who were in agreement went from 35% to 39.5%. And since they have scales, because you're supposed to rate it from one to 10, all levels of acceptance actually grew, uh, improved as well. So it was so successful that CSOs from Panama and Peru have actually reached out to, to launch the, the, the campaign uh, in their own countries. So I think this is, this is an example of the kind of um, education that also companies and, and CSOs can do and, and how it affects uh, people on the ground directly and how important this is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for these uh, uh, additional comments. Um, I, there is uh, another question from, from the audience. Uh, I think we could uh, have this dialogue for, for a very long time. It's very, very interesting. And I also would like to, to also note that we have some distinguished uh, members of the, of the audience that have expressed their they are interested in, in, in sharing some comments with, with us. So before I, I give the floor to them, I would like to uh, uh, pose this uh, maybe last question, unfortunately, because we have no more time. But um, this question is that, um, uh, what role do you see youth and youth-led civil societies uh, uh, organizations playing in the monitoring and reporting on early warning signs of atrocity crimes? What can the youth do? Take into account that they use digital means probably more than everybody. Akail, yes, please. Um, very brief comments. Um, I think the, the role of youth is key. Um, very now we, we refer or people talk to about youth growing up in this internet era as digital natives, that they've grown up with this technology um, on, at least on the social media side can play a, a, you know, a very important role. And they're on these platforms that 
UN diplomats are not on, that, that academics are not on. So they're at the forefront of seeing what is being shared. Um, I do think that youth, um, the digital literacy and programming by governments, by the UN, need to look at the role of youth, promote youth peace builders, try to look at influencers that can actually bring a positive message of peace um, in the space where there might be a lot of hate speech or divisions in society that take place uh, between groups. So, so I think engaging youth is key. Um, how, how GAMAC can support the UN framework on hate speech? Well, we can look at some of the key actors of the UN agencies. I know UNESCO, uh, UNICEF, um, all have key roles to play in countries where they have office representation and work with governments um, increasingly on the digital space, but also through the formal education system. So I think, I think that, that's, um, that is key. And just one last comment, um, my colleagues and I, we worked with Facebook. We had this Facebook digital narrative initiative to, to bring youth together to look at how to create counter narratives to hate speech and extremism online. Um, we trained about 30 Canadian students to do campaigns on hate speech. This is something that, that we did for about a $3,000 grant. Um, that could be replicated across many countries just to get youth involved. And, um, and I think those are some of the, the small measures that can be uh, duplicated in various countries and that could have an impact, a sustainable impact in the long run. If, if, if I may, Sylvia? Yes, Sarah, please. Um, I, I was going to tell you that I agree absolutely with what Kyle has said. And, and actually, I, I believe that youth and especially women in Costa Rica are doing a fantastic, fantastic job. Um, they have been, there are several um, girls and, and women and, and young ladies that decided to use their phones and decided to use their Facebook and Instagram accounts to, for example, talk about uh, racism. So there's there's an initiative called Mi Vida Afro, and and she's just she she just graduated from 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 university, and she's doing this amazing job because she's actually being able to speak to people in their own language and away from all the formalities and and how square we tend to be with with age. So actually, they they speak the same language, they keep it simple, they say it straight and direct. There's also another initiative also by, by, by Afro Costa Rican women um, that is called Costa Rica Afro, and they do the same. And they go in Twitter, they, they go everywhere. Um, and, and they're actually talking about intersectionality, they're talking about hate speech, they're talking about racism, and, and I think it's, it's amazing. I think we need to invite them to the table. They have actually made and continue to make their own space in the discussion. And it's important to engage them because they're the ones that that know how to how to talk to their to their peers and how to tackle um, with with the language and the the use of 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 the um, of the tools that actually internet provides. Thank you very much, and I'm truly sorry because this is really fascinating, and more questions are coming through the chat function and their excellent questions that I would like to, to really raise. But also we have been asked to give the floor to uh, the three distinguished members of the, uh, of the audience who asked for the floor. These are uh, Haider Elias, uh, co-founder and president for YASDA, a GAMAC partner. Mariana Goetz, founder director of Rights for Peace, another GAMAC partner, and Alphonse Fan president and CEO of the Raphael Lemkin Center for Africa and member of the Africa Working Group. I would like to give them the floor in this order, uh, uh, Mr. Haider, Mariana, and Alphonse Fan. Uh, please, I will ask them to be extremely concise because we are really running out of time, but it's really a pleasure to welcome them here in this, uh, in this event. So uh, uh, Elias Haider, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvia. Thank you uh, all for giving us the opportunity to uh, express our concern and our opinion about the hate speech, and especially that has affected the minorities in Iraq, such as Yazidis and Christians. I want to be concise, as you mentioned, and um, brief on a couple of the comments that I want to make. Uh, 
Yes, this work has been uh, very, very important in the region uh, since the beginning of its foundation and since ISIS committed genocide against the minority. Yes, there has done a lot of advocacy work, including founding Nadia Murad's campaign and, and promoting her uh, and a platoon very recently. Uh, I wanted to uh, mention a couple of points that it's related to hate speech. Uh, it's very relevant to the Yazidis and Christian minorities in Iraq that the hate speech has, um, tech, has been fed by uh, ISIS and, uh, and conducting and committing a lot of atrocities against uh, the Yazidis. Uh, for example, one of the propaganda that ISIS was... Uh, taking in consideration was that the Yazidis were devil worshippers and all they could found online was uh, that this minority that are polytheists, they believe more than one God and they believe in devil. And uh, this is one of the reason, additional reason that we should get rid of them. And another uh, point of hate speech was uh, a, counted against the Yazidis that uh, ISIS members uh, in a couple of occasions were beating Yazidi women in, in form of exorcism and trying to attempt to expulsion of the uh, evil spirit out of their bodies. And that was also resulted out of a hate speech and misinformation about, about the minority and especially the Yazidis over there. And, Yazidis that have been very, very much affected about that. Even another hate speech uh, issue that it was counted against the Yazidis, there was a family that, that uh, committed a crime against their daughter that, who married one Muslim uh, person back in 2007. And the, because of the online, a hate speech, it was spread all over the country. ISIS was well aware of that one particular case and used it against the entire community. That one family case, even though that has been a routine crime in the country and it happens to, to the women in daily basis. But ISIS even named a brigade on name of that woman who was killed because she was Muslim and she converted to Islam. And the thing is that with, with this speech, hate speech, especially online hate speech, uh, uh, you, you all mentioned and you covered a lot of great points and uh, that's correct that uh, this technology has its goods and its bad. And one of its uh, cons are uh, that hate speech that is spreads very fast. And when you Google something, you can find it anywhere and you can be fed with it and just it should be enough for you to make your point like ISIS and Al Qaeda members who want to commit genocide. So my final point is we all should ed ed encourage people and encourage governments to educate the world population about, about the minorities and about uh, those who are vulnerable. So education is the key point. It is, in my opinion, very difficult to force someone uh, to stop speaking about uh, and or, or having hate speech about certain minorities unless they are very educated on these on the topics and they feel to put themselves in their shoes. And so the ultimate point is the, the education because now even in Iraq and Kurdistan region, the Yazidi members of, of this community are not allowed to, to work in restaurants in many of the places because of religious issues and the hate speech. They're not allowed to work in bakeries. They're not allowed to sell products like dairies because of the religious figures in the region that says that Yazidis and other uh, polytheists there are not, um, even Yazidis are not, the Yazidis are monotheists, but they're not, they're not clean enough and they shouldn't be, you shouldn't be taking bread out of their hands or dairy. So my, my final point is uh, education, education and education. We should all educate world population about, about minorities, about everybody and hate speech will, will be decreased hopefully. Thank you very much for, for giving me the opportunity. 
Thank you very much, uh, Elias. And now I will give the floor to Mariana. And I would really, really urge you to be because we are really running out of time. But it's great to have you, Mariana. You are muted. Thank you. Gracias. Um, just really wanting to respond to the um, call for mobilizing the community into action and maybe just to share a few thoughts on, on how we can uh, break down all the different challenges perhaps in a useful way. Um, and the way in which we look at it here at Rights for Peace, which is a small organization and quite new to the mass atrocity prevention scene, is really breaking down what we call attitude and behavior change from the legal and political and regulatory advocacy work. And, and I think this applies to all mass atrocity prevention work, not just hate speech, but really what is helpful. So under the um, attitude and behavior change, really, I think what everybody's been picking up on in terms of education, which can be formal education and non-formal education is really vital. And I think actually quite a lot more um, needs to be thought about in terms of formal education. There are you know, numerous in informal education at, um, schemes which focus on skills and uh, values, you know, critical thinking, empathy building, perspective taking. Um, there's quite a lot of materials and thinking already about these um, different types of um, skills and values. But actually seeing those skills and values part of the national curricula, I think is really, really interesting. Um, and I, I shared in the in the chat window uh, an interesting resource um, from uh, Aegis Trust, where, where I used to work for some time, um, uh, that is a report based on a colloquium, which was called Building Resilience to Genocide Through Peace Education. And that really looks at these different skills and values and how the Rwandan um, government uh, has introduced them into the curriculum. So that's quite an interesting case study. and. Um, example. Um, but also one, one important thing in terms of the other side of things, which is where the uh, legal and regulatory and political advocacy is important, so this is all the other areas, um, is trying to connect, um, connect all our interest in hate speech with reporting on wider violations. Um, one thing that we've noticed is that, you know, we hear a lot about massacres, uh, torture, uh, mass rape, etc. But the hate speech that actually provides the bias intent that elevates those violations to something akin or on the road to genocide is often missing. And so I think that, you know, there's been a lot of interest this year in particular on hate speech. But one thing that maybe is ex interesting to explore is how to connect hate speech with other violations so that actually we are um, looking at them in the context in terms of systemic violations or, um, you know, racist uh, regime or other kinds of things. Um, and on that note, um, we are launching a report in January and hope also with GAMAC to be holding a panel discussion. News will come out about that shortly, I, I hope, with GAMAC. Um, the tentative date, I think, is the 26th of January. Um, it's sort of on the eve of Holocaust Memorial Day. And this report is really, it's a guide to um, hate crimes in international law. And the idea is to look at um, all the hate intent violations that we have in human rights law um, through a sort of prism of mass atrocity prevention. So many violations exist, but they haven't really been mapped out in terms of which ones have this bias intent that is sort of, we call it, preventing and punishing the steps to genocide. So how, how we get there, we know it's a process. So hopefully we can have another discussion further about these more human rights aspects later on. And I thank you very much um, for the time and opportunity to share a few thoughts with you and also learn and listen so much from many eminent and interesting people involved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Mariana. And uh, I now I have the pleasure to give the floor to Alphonse Fon. Well, yes, I think I'm coming through now. Thank you so much. Quickly, I wanted to say that when we look at uh, today's topic, mobilizing communities to act uh, against uh, hate speech, uh, this already 
is a very interesting topic, but uh, there are two uh, challenges in this. The first one is that hate speech is a political phenomenon because hate speech uh, is uh, usually had uh, during uh, elections like uh, Ambassador Muramula said and uh, like uh, uh, Duncan, uh, Shara Duncan said, uh, it is during the electoral periods that we hear the worst of hate speech. So certainly it is difficult to try and control people, to try and uh, um, police people's speeches during uh, elections. And uh, uh, the second challenge is that when we are talking about politics, there is no difference between those governing and the population, especially during electoral campaigns. Uh, the, govern the governors themselves, the people governing who are supposed to uh, exercise the highest restraint, uh, seem to be the first ones to be um, using uh, the most cruel of words or they are uh, worst of uh, uh, choices in making, they are making the worst of choices in speech. And sometimes it is difficult to know how we can control uh, hate speech, especially in Africa. Uh, given that everybody is participating, we know, for instance, that uh, the genocide in Rwanda was uh, worsened uh, by hate speech, uh, and that uh, these speeches uh, were mostly coming from leaders, the former ministers or uh, and other leaders have been arrested, have been tried by uh, uh, the International Tribunal for Rwanda for what they said at the time. So uh, to conclude, uh, there is uh, a challenge in terms of governance, uh, responsibility or accountability by the, gov by, by, by the government sometimes is difficult. Uh, we tend to quickly talk about reconciliation, but uh, militias, for instance, or ministers sometimes will be telling those who are in exile, if they come back, they will be punished. And it is very difficult. So uh, I think uh, the United Nations need to be taking initiatives in this and uh, GAMAC in particular, the Africa Working Group uh, need to be um, perhaps pronouncing itself more clearly. Uh, it needs to be taking uh, concrete steps to have some form of education, some form of sensitization of the African leadership in general to make sure that in future, um, there is perhaps behavior uh, that is working towards peace in our communities, in our societies. This is something we need to be uh, talking about uh, wider, but we don't have the time. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, sir. And try to, to summarize this very rich discussion. Maybe I will just underline words. One, education, formal and informal. Two, inclusion, inclusion of all stakeholders in order to reach uh, out to all stakeholders and have an, a, a holistic approach. Three, dialogue, in particular, engagement also with the private sector and big technological companies. And uh, fourth and final, support and liaise with all those that are promoting very important initiatives in this regard at the, U the UN, of course, UNESCO also for education has been mentioned, but of course, all other relevant organizations at the, uni at the uh, universal and regional level. Now, um, we will continue this conversation. We will continue this conversation through various online activities and discussions in 2021 as we head towards GAMAC global meeting in November 2021. For those who are interested in continuing the conversation and sharing good practice, we uh, ask them please fill in the form through the link in the chat so that the support office can register you on GAMAC's virtual platform, My GAMAC. And please do not go, stay online, as we will watch the highlights of today's discussion as captured by Sulma Patarroyo, our graphic recorder. And um, please, please, thank you. Uh, last but not least, thank you very much 
to our distinguished panelists for sharing their important insights. Thank you for the members of the audience who have uh, accompanied us and have shared with them with us their questions and their comments. Thank you for all the members that uh, distinguished members of the audience that have now spoken. And thank you everybody and goodbye, take care and happy holidays to everyone. Thank you.